Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Welcome to the first presentation in the CDC Dental Public Health Residency Lecture Series. My name is Gina Thornton Evans, and I'm the director of the CDC Dental Public Health Residency Program. This uh, lecture series was designed to help current and future dental public health residents gain a better understanding of the 10 dental public health competencies and of current topics in the field. These webinars are for current dental public health residents, prospective residents, and anyone else in the field of dental public health. There will be approximately one lecture each quarter, and our next uh, lecture will be on June 11th, and Dr. Richard Mansky will be our featured speaker. This and all presentations in this series will be recorded and posted on our Dental Public Health Residency page. If you have any questions with respect to future webinars and want to be notified, please contact us at dphresidency at cdc.gov. In terms of questions, um, please type your questions into the chat box during the presentation, but hold all verbal questions until the next, until the question and answer period starts. Just for reference, dental public health is defined as the science and art of preventing and controlling dental diseases and promoting dental health through organized community efforts. There are 10 competencies that define the knowledge and practice base developed by the American Association of Public Health Dentistry and the American Board of Dental Public Health. This slide shows the 10 competencies of which Number 10, integrate the social determinants of health into dental public health practice was a newly added competency. Before I hand it over to today's featured speaker, I just wanted to take a moment to highlight the residency program at CDC. Our program was established in 1996 with the purpose of our program to provide opportunities for residents to gain knowledge, experience and skills across all 10 designated competencies areas as a foundation for the examination and oral um, examination by the board. CDC residents will develop skills in the methods of scientific inquiry and research, emphasizing oral epidemiology and population-based efforts to prevent oral diseases and promote oral health, and be prepared to sit for the exam upon the completion of their residency. CDC has two, one to two openings available each year for full-time or part-time residency. The application opens every summer, approximately in August of each year. CDC has trained over 20 residents and over half have gone on to complete all parts of the American Board of Dental Public Health examination. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Rear Admiral Tim Ricks. Rear Admiral Tim Ricks has served in the U.S. Public Health Service for over 20 years. Uh, he completed a dental public health residency with the Indian Health Service and is a board-certified diplomate of the American Board of Dental Public Health and a fellow of the International College of Dentists. Rear Admiral Ricks currently serves as the Chief Dental Officer of the U.S. Public Health Service as well as Assistant Surgeon General. He serves as the Surgeon General spokesperson on oral health and interacts with chief dental officers from other countries, with military chief dental officers, with leaders in organized dentistry, with state oral health programs, and much more. He is currently overseeing the development of the second ever Surgeon General's report on oral health. It is my pleasure today to introduce Rear Admiral Rick. Thank you very much, Dr. Evans. Uh, Thornton Evans, and thank you and CDC for the invitation to speak today. Um, before I start talking about the Surgeon General's report, I'd like to first start by talking about the U.S. Public Health Service. Um, and in this critical time right now, um, I I'd like to share that our mission is to protect, promote, and advance the health and safety of our nation. And we're doing this through rapid and effective responses to public health needs, such as our ongoing deployments for 
uh, COVID-19. We also do this through leadership and excellence in public health practice and advancing public health science. We have dentists that work in multiple agencies under multiple departments. So within the Department of Justice, uh, U.S. Public Health Service dentists are in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Within the Department of Homeland Security, uh, all of the U.S. Uh, Coast Guard dentists are U.S. Public Health Service dental officers, and we also provide dentists to the U.S. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Health Service Corps. Within the Department of Health and Human Services, we have U.S. Public Health Service dentists uh, in the National Institutes of Health, in the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, in the Indian Health Service, in the Health Resources and Services Administration, and within the Food and Drug Administration. And just for future reference, if you know of any um, dentists that are interested in U.S. Public Health Service jobs, this slide shows the agency contacts, and this slide shows the current openings where you can find a search for vacancies. So let me first back up to the 2000 report uh, from the Surgeon General on oral health. This was the first ever report that was commissioned by the Surgeon General on oral health, and it was commissioned by then Surgeon General Vice Admiral David Satcher. And like the other 62 Surgeon General reports, uh, they're all available on surgeongeneral.gov. This report had as its major message that oral health means much more than healthy teeth, and it's integral to the general health and well-being of all Americans. The goals of that report were really outlined in 2003 in a follow-up report called a National Call to Action. And those goals were to improve and promote oral health, to improve the quality of life, and to eliminate oral health disparities. And I'd like to, for you to pay special attention to that oral health disparities goal because I'll come back to that in a few minutes. There were five uh, key actions that were called for in, in that call to action, and those included changing the perceptions of oral health uh, within communities and with our medical colleagues to replicate effective programs and proven intervention efforts. And I've got a um, picture to the right uh, of a state program called Nebraska Teeth Forever that's just one of many examples of uh, proven intervention and prevention programs. A third key action was to build the science base. A fourth was to increase oral health workforce diversity, capacity, and flexibility. And finally, uh, to increase collaborations, collaborations among federal and state partners and with um, community coalitions as well. So the question is, after spending billions of dollars over the last 20 years, shouldn't we have solved all of the, our oral health issues by now? And the, the Lancet is a publication from the uh, United Kingdom, and they rank the top 328 conditions, health burdens. And of the, the top 30, four were oral health related, with untreated dental caries in permanent teeth being the number one global disease burden. So that in itself should tell you why we need a Surgeon General's report on oral health at this point. But what I want to do is um, talk to you about some of the influences that have led to the creation of this report or, or this forthcoming report and how um, our practice, oral health and dentistry, will be affected over the next 20 years. But before I do that, let me talk a little bit about our current Surgeon General. Our current Surgeon General, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, is formerly the health officer of the state of Indiana. And like Surgeon Generals before him, he has outlined some key uh, priorities. His motto is that we can achieve better health through better partnerships. And those four uh, overarching priorities include substance misuse, which includes the op ongoing opioid epidemic, tobacco, and e-cigarettes. 
community health and economic prosperity is a second priority of his. And that is really to show what the impact of good health is to the economy. A third priority of his is health and national security, and specifically how health or core health affects military eligibility and readiness and deployability of our active duty soldiers. And, our, and his fourth and the most important one to us is a priority on oral health. And I've got a link there. Uh, it's a YouTube video where he discussed um, his call to action for oral health uh, and, and his charge to uh, creating this report. But you, if you don't want to copy that link, you can just go to YouTube and um, type in Surgeon General Oral Health, and it'll take you right to it. So what I want to do now is talk about the influences um, of on oral health uh, for the past 20 years and the next 20 years. The one thing we have to realize, and many of us do, is that the world has changed rapidly in the last 20 years, and especially the digitization, <laughs> becoming more digital, um, and the demographic changes. Uh, if you look at this line graph, in 2000, we had 304 million people worldwide that ha had access to the World Wide Web or Internet out of a population of 6.1 billion. By 2019, over half the world's population, 4.3 billion out of 7.7 .7 billion, accessed the Internet. At the same time, we've seen things like e-commerce really take off in the last 20 years uh, especially. And, you know, when I present this slide um, in dental schools and I ask the young uh, dental students how many of them go uh, have shopped physically in a store in the last month, very few hands go up. Amazon and other e-commerce uh, is very prevalent now. And in fact, in the U.S., uh, e-commerce is a $3.45 trillion industry each year. So it's a huge, huge issue. Now let's talk, you remember I mentioned that one of the goals of the 2003 call to action was to reduce and eliminate oral health disparities. So I want to start there in talking about how the U.S. has changed or not changed in the past 20 years. This table show is pretty busy, but I want to highlight um, some disparities. So at the top, you can see the, the columns are various um, disease conditions in different age groups. And if you go to the third, fourth, and fifth rows, where you compare uh, black non-Hispanic Americans and Mexican Americans to white non-Hispanic Americans. You can see that across the board that black non-Hispanic Americans and Mexican Americans, for the most part, um, suffer disproportionately from these different disease characteristics or conditions when compared to white non-Hispanic Americans. And then if you look at the bottom two rows and look at those that are at or below 200% of the federal poverty level, which is roughly $25,000 for a family of four, and compared those, um, the very poor, to those that are at or above 200% of the federal poverty level, you'll see that the very poor suffer twice, at least twice as much disease in these different uh, um, disease conditions as do uh, those that are, are wealthier. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, and especially since Dr. Thornton Evans mentioned that uh, social determinants is one of the uh, 10 competencies for dental public health, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, we in oral health need to look beyond the mouth and look at social determinant, determinants of health. Um, this is just a drawing, uh, a schematic with periodon status in, in the middle, but you could put caries or other oral conditions as well. 
And I think it's really important for us to understand that as practicing dentists, there are a lot of things that are well with outside of our control in improving the oral health of communities and individuals. And one example I like to use is, especially when I'm talking to practicing dentists, is that, you know, when a patient breaks an appointment, oftentimes we'll blame the patient. We'll say the patient was noncompliant, when in fact there could be a host of uh, social issues. Maybe the the patient is working three jobs to pay rent uh, for last month, or they have food insecurity or, or so forth. So I think we as oral health professionals need to keep these facts in mind that there are a lot of um, determinants beyond just what we think we can control in our offices. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, and this is really important to us, is the aging population. So if you look at this graph, in 2000, there were roughly 35 million Americans over the age of 65 years. By 2030, that will have more than doubled to seven, over 71 million. And if we put that into perspective, if you that 30 uh, or 71 million would be more than the population of the 25 least populous states in the U.S as highlighted on the map. And to put it another way, um, if all of the current adults, 65 years and older in the U.S., held hands, they would circle the globe twice. Now the causes of this booming aging population is that our baby boomer generation, those that were born between 1946 and 1964, they're living longer because of advances in modern medicine. Um, so that that is one of the primary reasons um, for the, the growing population of elders. And in fact, by 2035, what we'll see for the first time in U.S. history is more adults over the age of 65 than under the age of 18. So it, that should all give us pause because we most of us understand the uh, lack of resources uh, currently available uh, oral health resources currently available to those over the age of 65 um, as far as insurance and Medicare coverage. Um, and we should also consider the enormous amount of resources we have poured into children under the age of 18. Another thing that economists look at is something called the dependency ratio. And basically what this is, is the, it's the burden that is placed upon working adults to take care of uh, older adults and to take care of youth. So if you look at the graph on the right uh, and ignore the light blue, that's the youth. Those are children under the age of 16, whether they work or not. And the purple is people over the age of 65, whether they work or not. And we do have um, data that show that more and more people over the age of 65 are working. But for simplicity, uh, we'll consider all the people over the age of 65 in the purple. And if you look um, at, to the left again, in 2000, for every 100 working adults, we had 20 people in that purple range, 20 older adults over the age of 65. Today, that has uh, escalated or increased to 28 older adults for every 100 working adults. And by 2040, it will almost have doubled from 2000 to 38 for every 100 working adults. And what this will do is economists suggest that this will put a strain on the economy. Uh, it will affect retirement, pension plans, interest rates, housing markets, and so forth. Uh, so that's something that may impact oral health as well. In addition, um, these modern advances in health also come with a price tag. And this, this um, graph here shows that with each additional chronic disease that an older American brings with them, 
there are additional per capita costs. And so someone with five chronic conditions will bring an additional 12,699 per capita uh, or cost um, on average. One thing we have seen is uh, looking at NHANES data is that um, the disparity uh, between the poor and the non-poor has really changed in older Americans, uh, has really increased. So if you look at this um, bar graph, the poor is in the light blue and the dark blue is the non-poor. And I've highlighted the difference. This is the uh, percentage of older Americans uh, in those categories with a functional dentition as defined by having uh, at least 21 teeth. And so you'll see back in the NHANES period of 1988 to 1994, almost 40% of the non-poor uh, older Americans had a functional dentition, and about 18%, 17-18% of the poor had a functional dentition. Fast forward to the most recent data we have from 2009 to 14, you'll see that both groups increase. So that the light blue, you'll see went from around 17% to around 25%. But you'll see the non-poor, which is the dark blue, increase from about 38% to 67%. And so that disparity between the um, prevalence between uh, a functional dentition between the uh, non-poor and poor has really doubled over the past two decades, as highlighted in the yellow. When we ask, um, or when the ADA Health Policy Institute asked older Americans to self-report their oral health, what we saw was that 44% of those in the low household income bracket reported their oral health as either fair or poor compared to less than 15% of those in high household incomes. The next topic I want to talk about is a changing workforce. So the Health Resources and Services Administration, or HRSA, designates shortage areas in primary care, mental health, and oral health. The, this map shows the designated uh, dental health professional shortage areas, or HIPSAs, across the U.S. And most of Nebraska, Nebraska has its own system, um, so that's why it's white, but most of Nebraska, other than Lincoln and Omaha, would normally be shaded uh, in gray as well. But HRSA estimates that there are 58 million people in dentist, um, dental HIPSAs now, and that there are 5,800 uh, individual HIPSAs. They also estimate that it would take 10,593 uh, oral health practitioners to, to fill those um, dental HIPSAs. But one of the drawbacks or one of the hindrances is that uh, many new dental graduates simply uh, won't go to rural areas where many of these HIPSAs are. And one of the reasons for that is uh, the enormous debt that they have upon graduation. The American Dental Education Association uh, says that the average dental student debt is, I believe, $287,000. Another thing that, you know, speaking of dental schools, is that our supply of dentists has greatly increased over the last 17 years by 22%, and that's what the graph on the left shows. But if you look at that and compare it or, or look at per popula 100,000 population, the increase is less substantial. It's only 6%. These two graphs show uh, they're both from the same um, place, the American Dental Association Health Policy Institute, but they show a change in the way practices are set up. So on the left, looking at the period of 1999 to 2017, um, this is the percentage of dentists in solo private practice. 
And you can see that in 1999, it was almost two-thirds of all dentists were solo practitioners. And by 2015, that had dropped to just 50%. However, on the, the right-hand side, this pie chart shows that uh, currently there's 63%. This was for 2016. Uh, slightly different methodology, 63% were in group practices that were not affiliated with corporate dentistry or dental support organizations. 27.9% were in solo practice, and 8.3% were in DSO-affiliated practices. Another change that we've seen is the rise of dental therapy. And this was begun in 2000 in um, the state of Alaska. It was brought over from New Zealand. And in 2009, Minnesota became the first state to authorize dental therapy. And currently, there are 13 states that have authorized some form of dental therapy. Um, I believe this is correct that our, currently there are only practicing dental therapists in Minnesota, Alaska, Washington, and Oregon. And Washington and Oregon are, and Alaska are in tribal programs. Uh, there are also many other states that are considering um, different dental therapy models as well. But one thing that's really important is to understand, and most of you probably know this, is that there is not one standard dental therapy model. Uh, dental therapy, there's no standard in education. I mean, they can um, have just a high school diploma in, in some places, and in some places they have a master's degree. Um, and there is no standard in the number of hours that uh, preceptorship that they um, should have. So they, these are all things, but um, dental therapy is certainly on the rise, and it is um, certainly helping address access to care uh, in some of those dental health professional shortage areas. Okay, the next thing I'd like to talk about is mental illness and substance abuse, which will also be in uh, the forthcoming Surgeon General's report on oral health. And I want to uh, show this slide, but to make the distinction that these, I, I basically put two separate uh, facts on the same slide, and they're not directly related. Um, but there's a point to this. So teenagers that uh, report uh, reporting mental illness in the past year, total six, 765,000 in the U.S. So this is a very vulnerable population. At the same time, and I think most of you have probably seen this graph, that dentists are the top prescribers of opioids for the 10 to 19 year old age group. Again, these are, I'm just trying to make the uh, point that this is a vulnerable population and that we are, um, dentists are top prescribers in that age group. And in fact, if you look, this is a slightly different age group. The previous was 10 to 19. This is 11 to 18. But if you look for the time period of 2010 to 2015, you'll see that there was about a, a 50 to 60 percent increase in the number of um, opioid prescriptions written by dentists per thousand patients in that age group. And in fact, what we know is that dentists prescribe 18.5 million um, prescriptions of opioids, which is only 6.4% of um, all opioid prescriptions. And I think that's a really important point that overall dentists aren't the top contributors or, and really nowhere close. But the concern is, of course, that uh, 10 to 19 or 11 to 18 year old age group. And so I want to show this slide, and I'm, I'm not sure how well you can see those numbers, so I'll describe this. This is also from the ADA Health Policy Institute. But the, what I want to show is that the dental profession has done a very good job um, self-policing opioid prescribing over the years. So if you look at 1998, 15.5% of all opioid prescriptions were written by dentists. And as I just showed on the previous slide in 2012, that had decreased to where dentist prescriptions for opioids 
uh, only totaled 6.4 percent of of the total number of opioid prescriptions. And when we look at the opioid overdose death, it really has happened in three waves. Really starting in the late 1990s, there was the rise in prescription opioid overdose deaths. And then a second wave was the rise in heroin overdose deaths that began in 2010 and has sort of leveled off. And then this third wave is what we're experiencing now, and it continues, and that is the synthetic opioids like fentanyl um, perhaps being export or imported into the country. Um, among 15 to 49-year-olds in the U.S., almost one in five of all deaths were attributed to substance use disorders in 2017. This is more than double that of our neighbors to the north and far more than our neighbors to the south. And this prompted the Surgeon General of the United States, again, Vice Admiral Jerome Adams, to issue an advisory or warning on opioid overdose. And in this advisory, uh, which is also available at surgeongeneral.gov, the Surgeon General advised uh, healthcare professionals, friends and family of people that had uh, opioid use disorder, and, and others to uh, carry with them naloxone and learn to use it. I want to show this um, postcard. It is on the Surgeon General's website. There are um, multiple uh, postcards and flyers and things that you can download and print and put in your dental office uh, and share with your patients. With regard to adults, there are 45 million adults, or 18% of the population, that have a diagnosed mental illness or substance abuse problem. 6.7% um, report illicit drug dependence or abuse. So there's a, a quite a distinction between those that are self-reporting and those that have been diagnosed. Next thing I want to talk about are health care expenditures. So in 2016, the U.S. spent $3.3 .3 trillion on health care. This is more than five times that of China. It's the current billion, even though China has five times the population of the United States. And it's far more than the $177 billion uh, in their universal health care that our neighbors to the north in Canada offer. Or spent. And this slide just shows a bunch of different countries um, and, and their per capita expenses. And what I really want to point out is if you look all the way to the right, uh, you can see that the U.S. far exceeds every other country with per capita health care expenditures of over $10,000. The next closest uh, country is Switzerland at 8000 per capita. If we look at dental expenditures and adjust for inflation, what we've seen over the last 20, 25 years is a doubling in the total dental expenditures from $60 billion to $120 billion. And in fact, what we know now is that a quarter of all um, health care expenses, out-of-pocket expenses, are dental-related. And this graph, this, this graph shows the uh, percentage of people that did not select health care services that they needed because of those out-of-pocket costs. And it compares dental, which is in the purple, to medical care, prescription care, eye care, and mental health care. And what you'll see is across all age groups that more people are willing to forego dental care because of those out-of-pocket expenses than any other type of health care. I mentioned before that the Surgeon General, one of his priorities is community health and economic prosperity. And I, I, this is just a slide from him that shows that um, this is a, a one, the next report that's going to come from the Surgeon General. And I already mentioned that what um, the, the purpose of this report is to show the impact of good oral health, uh, good health and oral health 
uh, on uh, economic prosperity. The final thing I want to mention as far as influences on uh, oral health is the uh, emerging public health threats. So one of the questions I often ask the audiences in person when I present this is what is the number one HPV attributed cancer? And most people still say that cervical cancer is the top HPV attributed cancer when in fact it is now oral pharyngeal cancer. And I highlighted that on this um, slide that there are 12,885 cases um, that per year that are attributed um, to HPV that are oral pharyngeal cancer. And the biggest rise has been in males. Another emerging threat is e-cigarettes. And I want to spend a little time on this because between 27 and 2018, we saw a record increase among teens. And if you look at where I pointed the arrow, 37% um, of 12th graders reported past year vaping. That's not that surprising. These are 17 and 18 year olds, sometimes 19. But what is surprising is if you look at the eighth graders, those that are uh, 14, 15 year old kids, almost one in five uh, report vaping. And this prompted the Surgeon General to issue an advisory on e-cigarettes as well. Uh, what is a little more troubling, and I think these numbers have increased since this uh, report came out, is that nearly one in 11 are used, students are using e-cigarettes for cannabis and cannabinoids um, and not just for nicotine. And I'll mention that, um, you know, when I was talking to young people about this, several years ago when e-cigarettes came out, many of them said, well, there's no consequence to e-cigarette use. And, and, that, and I, many of us in public health said, well, just wait, the research is, is coming. And uh, instead what happened was we had this outbreak of lung disease and it's called e-valley or e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury. And the CDC, as of February 18th, said that there are 2,800 cases of hospitalized e-valley uh, that affect all the states, two territories, and the District of Columbia. And 68 uh, confirmed deaths were related to e-valley. The median age was 24 years, or is 24 years, with 15% under 18 years of age. Um, there, the, the real sharp rise occurred back late last year with a peak in September of 2019. And since then, there's been a gradual and persistent decline. And from the CDC website this morning, I found out the CDC is no longer providing an update on the hospitalized cases and deaths nationally after that February 18th um, uh, report. So, I, and I did not mention at all the um, coronavirus, COVID-19, as an emerging threat. Uh, at this point, I'm not authorized to, to speak on COVID-19. So let me now move to what all this means for the upcoming Surgeon General's report on oral health. As I mentioned, the Surgeon General had a charge, um, and I'll let you read this to yourself, this was the charge to the team, our oral health, um, HHS Oral Health Coordinating Committee, as well as the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, which are the primary authors of the report or overseeing the authorship. Mm -hmm. um, this is what the Surgeon General's charge to the group was. And I'll pause for a minute and let you read. Okay, so the, the big questions from this report will be where are we now? What changes or advances have we made since that 2000 report? What challenges still persist? What new threats are emerging? I've described some of those today. And where are some of the new 
uh, promising new directions for research and improvement in oral health. The report has six different sections, and these are the six sections. Uh, one section will be the effect of oral health on the community, overall well-being, and the economy. And then there will be a section on oral health in children and adolescents, another one on adults and older adults. A fourth section will be on oral health integration, workforce, and practice. Fifth section will be effects of addiction and mental health disorders on oral health. And finally, emerging technologies and promising science to transform oral health. There are six section editors and 20 associate editors, and they're responsible for the six different um, sections. Uh, to date, we have over 400 researchers and health care professionals, not all just oral health professionals, that have either contributed to the report by writing or reviewing different sections. We also have a very, um, like all Surgeon General reports, there's a very distinct federal clearance process uh, that ensures that the standards of the Department of Health and Human Services and those of the Surgeon General are met. Uh, we expect the report will emphasize the importance of poor oral health as a public health issue. We think it will reinforce the importance of oral health throughout the lifespan uh, describe some of these important contemporary issues affecting oral health, especially uh, discussing oral health disparities or inequities, and outline a vision for future research and policy directions. And finally, uh, we hope it will educate, encourage, and call upon all Americans to take action. And I mentioned that last bullet because this report, unlike the 2000 report, will have a call to action built within the report. And that concludes my presentation. So we've got a few minutes for questions, and I will go through the chat box to begin with. So one question was, will we have access to the slide deck? Um, unfortunately, the slide deck itself I can't make available, but you can, of course, uh, read it uh, or reread the uh, review the um, webinar itself. Um, Dr. Tomar said we should refer to oral health inequities rather than disparities. He says there is an element of social justice and unfairness to the situation, not just the difference in health status or access to care. And I agree wholeheartedly. So very good point. Thank you. Um, when will the report be released? That is the next question. And the answer is we don't know. It's um, we're in the we have a target of late fall uh, 2020, and we're we're aiming for that um, target. So there's a lot of moving parts right now. There the report has been written. It is undergoing review. Uh, different chapters or, or sections are getting reviewed. Um, by different reviewers right now. And then once it goes through that process, it will be delivered to the Office of the Surgeon General, and then it has to go through a clearance process in the um, Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and then through the various agencies of the Department of Health and Human Services. So there's a lot of um, things that could happen that would affect the release of the report uh, or the timeline of the release of the port report in a um, in, in a way that may make the release earlier or later. So it's it's really hard to predict at this point. And I, I believe that's all the chat box questions. Uh, if you want to unmute and ask any questions verbally, now would be a good time. There is one Can more. Please press um, star six. For Admiral Rick, yep. have them to press star six to okay. unmute themselves. And there is one more question. I just Shall saw that. So, question? Okay. The question is regarding the e-cigarette stat that nearly one in eleven students are using e-cigs for K 
cannabis use? Is that one in 11 among students using e-cigs or amongst all students? And I'll go back to that slide, if you can bear with me for a second, and I'll show it to everyone. And so this is the ones that are vaping. So it's one out of 11 students that are using e-cigarettes, if that helps. And there's the slide. Okay. Are there um, any other questions for Rear Admiral Rick? Um, please press uh, star six to unmute yourself. All right, well, um, Dr. Thornton Evans and CDC staff, um, I appreciate the invitation and appreciate um, the great questions. And if anyone has any questions um, after the, the call, feel free to email me at usphscdo at ihs.gov. And I think my um, email is in the, the last uh, slide that, that I shared. So, and I'll type in the chat, chat box as well. And I want to thank all of the participants on the phone line. If you have um, any questions or other comments, please uh, email us at dphresidency at cdc.gov. And we'll have more information about the upcoming uh, lecture by Dr. Rich Mansky uh, scheduled for June 11th. All right. Thank you, Dr. Thornton Evans. Thank you, Rear Admiral Rick. And everyone enjoy the rest of their afternoon.